Hello, everyone. My name is T. James Reagan, and this is the T. James Reagan Podcast, coming to you live from Newark, New Jersey. Our guest today is no one. It's just going to be me again. The first episode, you remember that episode? I talked for the first half of it in just a free-form disaster, and then I read the essay Vice Rejected. This time, I'm going to talk in a free-form disaster, then read an essay Vice Rejected. It's going to be a rolling theme that you're going to see on this podcast here. If you want someone interviewing someone else, then all podcasts on iTunes will handle your needs. I think you could go grab them. My podcast isn't even on iTunes because they're like, you need at least eight stand-up comedians before we let you in here. So without that, it's just me. And this podcast, this piece, I would say, dates back to, there were two drafts of it. Because it sort of evolved, where the piece is about the 2014 man of the year. And writing a piece about the 2014 Man of the Year, when roughly two months of 2014 have gone by, maybe that's why Vice didn't publish it the first time. Maybe they were like, let's wait another, I'd say, nine months to do the year-end review instead of ending the year about 62 days in, which I think is when the first draft was. And then the second draft happened when Transformers 4 came out. And you'll sort of figure out why that happened. The first episode of this podcast wasn't a success. It's not up for debate. It's not like, maybe we had some moments there that worked. They didn't work. I don't know how many downloads the last podcast got because the free service I use isn't like, we should extend our free services to provide Tom with more information so he can figure out just how unpopular he is. I think it's an enhanced feature of the service that I don't know how bad I'm doing in the downloads. Where they're like, a million people downloaded it. We'll tell you if it goes over a million. But if it goes under a million, just assume a million. It'll make you feel better. You might actually record a second episode if that's the case. Honestly, I also uploaded it to YouTube. And looking at the YouTube views, it has less views than my vlog. Which is hard to do, because the vlog views are not triple digits. So it's safe to assume that pretty much everyone listening to this now knows me because of my writing. But if you don't know me because of my writing, I wrote my debut novel, Famous for Nothing, which is a satire on celebrity culture, which I actually, before I published it, I had sent a copy to the 2014 Man of the Year. It was probably around 2012 at the time. He was doing damn good in 2012. He wasn't having a 2014 in 2012, but he was 2012 and his dick and balls off. So I sent it to him then. He didn't respond. A very vicey thing to do, if you ask me. So in a way, the 2014 Man of the Year rejection and Vice Magazine's rejection have come together to create this podcast. But no hard feelings, no hard feelings. I'm dealing with it in a rational and healthy way. And so I have my first novel out, Famous for Nothing, Celebrity Blogging Satire. You can get that on Amazon. It's $4. And then my second novel is Empire Waste, where it's my most personal novel, and it's about creation and pain. We'll get back to the creation part of that, because creation is an overall looping arc on this entire podcast. And I don't know if creating this podcast was the right thing to do. I don't know if it increases the value of my personal brand or decreases it. And the fact that I'm unironically using the term personal brand probably indicates that my personal brand is already so low that anything would be an improvement. But it's about discovery now. There's so much content. Now I have to be a guy who records music and writes four different blogs and does vlogs and does podcasts. Also, people actually buy the one thing I do give a shit about, which is my books. And so I tried to think about how I discovered stuff that I'm currently into right now. Overwhelmingly, I found that what's interested me is the opposite of what most people are providing me. 
Like, I'm not even interested in people with specific talents. I think before I would be like, oh man, he's really smart guy. Look at him on Jeopardy! Or something like that. And then I would, I don't know. I don't, I don't think it was ever like standing for Jeopardy guys. I'm not like, oh, you see that? He fucking, who is that? I don't even know how Jeopardy works. I think they like, Alex, who is Alexander the Great? I don't even know if the guy who hosts it is Alex. Alex Trebek? That seems right. But none of the people I was finding had a Jeopardy talent. Where I wasn't saying like, wow, they're good at this thing, and that thing makes me happy, so they're a person I like now. Which is sort of how I'm hoping fame works, because I'm not a person that people like, so I'm hoping that they like the thing I create, and then they can be like, oh, we'll put up with Tom because he did that thing that was dope. That's my hope. I don't know if we're going to achieve that. Could be a failure. So instead of finding someone I really like a lot, I'm finding that there are these people that I sort of stumble across, and then they're withholding information, so I keep visiting back on whatever their little niche of the world is. Where withholding information now is the most attractive thing to me which doesn't make any sense because I'm doing a podcast providing disposable information, so I'm technically not interested in me, but I'm already such a big fan of me that I can't really like me anymore, so I should start liking me less. Because the more information I was getting on people, the less I was liking them. Like now, I literally work to not know who my friends are fucking. It's easier that way and it makes them more intriguing now it's a situation where it's the weekend and on the weekend i've been informed that you're going to this fun thing on friday night because you posted a status oh i'm going to the fun thing on friday night then when you get to the fun thing you post a picture of the fun thing and so i look at the picture and i see all the people who are there and i was like oh jim likes fun things too i look at the pictures scroll there are too many of them so i know you're getting more drunk and then the pictures sort of disappear you're off the radar for a while there's like an 11 hour period of time where there's no information from you at all and i'm like oh they're either sleeping or jumping rope and then it comes back with the text messages of you waking up texting me about what you did the night before or sending me a facebook message or something like that and then now i have to deal with this where it's like now i have to get the recap for the moments where it's like hey you know those times i wasn't taking pictures here's what was happening and then now i have this full cube of the weekend and basically like i have to try to take weekends off from people I used to be interested in because their entire weekend it starts consuming my weekend. I need a vacation from anyone who's taking a vacation recently. And that's a problem. It's like the mystery of it all has been stripped away and all that we're left with is information that we don't want but we receive it in bulk. Like for example, one of the new discoveries of like a person I keep coming back to is this I don't even know how to describe... I'm not going to name her by name because this is... It's, it could be a mean thing if you didn't understand the context I was bringing this in on. It would seem like I was needlessly pouring it on here. But basically, as near as I can tell, she's just a heavily make-uped e-celebrity. The thing is, is that she's very open about a lot of stuff, but very obviously physically she's suffering from an eating disorder there's no question about it it's not like oh i wonder if she just doesn't have a mcdonald's by her house keeping off those pounds no high fructose corn syrup no like there's no question about it and so she's putting all this information online but anytime it's sort of hinted at brought up there could be a segue into it about this eating disorder it's totally veered in a different direction. And that's the interesting arc now, is that why is it veering in a different direction when it's already public knowledge, where it's sort of, if you're watching a TV show, oh, the killer is looming in the living room, and then you watch, you know, the girl go upstairs and brush her teeth and talk to a guy upstairs, and then he's like, have you been down in the living room lately? And she's like, no, 
I should check on the living room. And then she she's going down the stairs and she's going down the stairs. But in this situation, the staircase is like one of those fucking MC Escher paintings, drawings, where it's just like staircase, 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 staircase. And we're going down this staircase forever and ever. And as we're walking more and more, the tension sort of like increases. Like, why aren't we reaching the living room at some point? which is what I'm feeling, why I'm interested in this girl. And so that's one of those things I was thinking about where I don't think this podcast is particularly helpful for if I want people to be intrigued in me, but I need a way for them to sort of discover me. If we could find a way for one million people to listen to this, then I'd never make another podcast again because I'd be like, well, I got the thing, now a million people can go look at my book or, you know, comment on my eating disorder vaguely in their podcast. And the other thing that intrigued me now, where I hate to keep bringing, the, <laughs> bringing this guy up, I talked about him in the first podcast. I pretty much, probably like my third or fourth podcast is just going to be devoted to this guy, just so we can get it all out of the way. But another guy that I find really interesting right now is James Franco. You know, I probably look like a James Franco ho or J- James Frank ho for mentioning him so often but really it's just the fact that he's the only contemporary amazon has given me so far and also he's very prolific the way i work on things and the way i'm creating things i feel like somewhere you know how like in those romance movies a girl and a guy will like look up from different sides of the world and be like we're under the same moon right now we're so far away but we're under the same moon right now anytime i'm creating i can look at my computer screen and think we're behind the same screen right now james franco's doing some weird shit that'll be poorly received behind his computer as well and so it's like a a bonding thing But one of the things I noticed was that James will read different pieces, where most recently he read a fictional, you know, like Lindsay Lohan portion of his Bungalow 89 piece that I discussed in my first podcast. And for that one, there's something bizarrely intimate about it. I'm not saying I have a super professional podcast because I'm drinking while I'm doing it. No one's like... The way you run your podcast is how I want to run my air traffic control center. No, that's not it. It's just, in the beginning of the piece that he's reading, you can sort of, like, hear him fumbling with, like, either the iPhone that he's reading it off of or the microphone he has or whatever, where it's, like, very unprofessional and there's a weird intimacy that's created there. It's a guy who is, you know, either normally getting paid a shitload of money to be like, I'm the Wizard of Oz, because James Franco doesn't give a fuck about being the Wizard of Oz. James Franco was never like, someday, when I'm a grown-up man, I'm going to be the Wizard of Oz. Sam Raimi just called up and he's like, yo, Green Goblin, you want to get some fucking Disney cash? And he's like, fuck yeah, I want to get some Disney cash. And then Sam Raimi's like, I hope that Wizard of Oz is a Disney property because that's how Tom framed this hypothetical conversation. And Franco's like, don't fucking worry about it, man. I'm there. Oz out. Slams the phone down. That's just whoring for money. But this thing here where it's like weirdly seems like he got out his iPhone and he's like, I'm going to read this thing and I'm going to send it to Vice. There's like a thing where that's, he's a dude. He's not the wizard. He's the wizard showing us what's behind the curtain and he's sort of like, I don't give a shit if you look at what's behind the curtain. Here it is. You can download behind the curtain on fucking SoundCloud. Put it on your iPod Nano. But he did this a couple times, and I actually noticed that the more interesting version he did was audio only. There was an audio and video one that he did for Paris Review, and they put on like an old-timey filter where they're like, Oh, is this James Dean reading the piece, or is it Franco? And then as he fell asleep in the middle of the piece, you're like, It's clearly Franco! I'm just joking. It was very good. I liked it. I tweeted about it. I downloaded it. I thought it was great. But... The Strictly Audio, more so than the audio and video, was what I liked the most. It, I don't know, it just seemed like something that you aren't getting from other people. 
which is sort of why I ended up doing this podcast was because I got interested in Franco because of these weird things that you weren't getting from other people. No one else is reading me a story where I would love for you to read me a story. Can I just say that right now? Where if you want to, you can go tjamesreagan at outlook.com. You can send me a link of you reading anything. Like it can't be... If I get a message from you and I was like, oh, this beautiful girl emailed me this intimate thing, and then you're reading a shampoo bottle, I'll be like, and she's shitting. That's the theater of the mind. You will get a promise that I will always be wearing pants when I record these. Unless it gets really hot out. It is the summertime. I will always be wearing at least underwear when I record these. What I was saying, the reason why I gave you my address, my email address, was so that you can send me something if you read it. Where you, whatever you want to read to me, read it, record it, you can upload it, you can put it on SoundCloud, you can put it on Mediafire, you can send me a link, you can call my cell phone and just read to me, and I promise I'll listen. Whatever you send me to tjamesreagan at outlook.com, I will listen to. And you sort of owe me, because I'm about to read my 2014 Man of the Year essay. And so, I've done it twice for you now, you've done it zero times for me. Again, like the first podcast, this was an essay I wrote for Vice, I sent it to him twice, two different rewrites, received the vice response of, Absolutely nothing! I stared into the infinite abyss that is my email account as Vice did not send me shit. They didn't even tell me I was crazy and I should go get fucked. They just didn't respond at all. So without further ado, Vice Rejection Saga, Part 2, 2014 Man of the Year. It's the most recent version of the essay, and if you like it, then you can go on tjamesreagan.com and you can listen to my other podcast, or you can purchase one of my books for $3.99. If you don't like it, then tune in next week for another rejected piece from Vice. The Vice Rejection Saga, Part 2 Shia LaBeouf, 2014 Man of the Year You don't go to the museum. Statistically, I can say that with confidence. Instead of going to the museum, you probably just watched Transformers 4 last night. Based on the box office receipts of the run of the film, I can make that assumption. You seek out Transformers because you don't really get art. You know better than to look at a sculpture or a painting and say, that's not hard, I could have done that. Because some girl on a school field trip once hit you with the boilerplate, but you didn't, response, and it kind of shut you down. You've given art a chance. You once saw Tilda Swinton's exhibit at the MoMA and probably said something along the lines of, what's this one called, Bitch in a Box? When you saw Marina Abramovic at the MoMA, for the artist is present, you probably started thinking, this is the exact same thing as the Tilda exhibit except they let this lady out of the box. Why was Tilda in that box? Maybe Tilda wasn't in the box to protect her from us. Maybe Tilda was in that box to protect us from her. At some point, you probably stood there and thought, if this lady's so interested in art, why didn't she just ride an animatronic alien dinosaur into battle with a giant robot who also converts into an SUV that comfortably seats four and informs your stepson if he's about to back into your non-transforming car? You shouldn't be embarrassed if that's your idea of art. It's exciting, and it's accessible. Shia LaBeouf was in three of those Transformer movies that you enjoyed a lot more than the stuff you saw at the MoMA. He isn't in the latest Transformer because he's busy taking what was in the MoMA, and he's bringing it to you. Just because Shia wasn't in Transformers doesn't mean he was absent from film this year. Lars von Trier's Nymphomaniac is Shia's one 2014 film credit, aside from the upcoming Brad Pitt-led Fury. Please note that's a movie called Fury, not a campaign of anger and destruction led by Brad Pitt. That would be called Fight Club 2. In the very unfight clubby nymphomaniac, we find typical Von Trier fare. An exploitive situation, a bleak story, the same pathetic unrealistic try-hard sex scenes that have pervaded all of Von Trier's past films. What happened off-screen in Dogville is now fully on-screen in Nymphomaniac, 
but it doesn't make it a better movie. This is a real example of a scene in Nymphomaniac. In the film, Charlotte Gainsbourg talks about how she lost her virginity. And so it does this flashback, and the guy who takes her virginity is played by Shia. And basically, she recounts that he couldn't get his moped to start. She said, I want to lose my virginity to you. He said, okay, there's my mattress on the floor. She got down on the floor. He pumped in her three times, turned her over, put it in her ass, pumped it in her five times. Now, the guy she's telling this story to, one of those scars guards, he's in most of these Von Trier films. He, like, he was the bad guy in uh, that movie about, like, the, the cyber goth hacker who had to avenge people, and that David Fincher movie where he was, like, the only guy you notice besides Rooney Mara or James Bond, and you're like, I wonder who the killer is in this film. It couldn't be the only other established actor in the movie. But anyways, she explains that three-pump, five-pump thing to this old man, and the old man's sitting there, and what does an old man say when you tell him a hot story about how you lost your virginity? Those numbers are in the Fibonacci sequence! That was literally the dialogue for the scene. How I don't know how that got past a table read, where someone was like, Lars, uh... You just talking about something really sexy, and then the guy said, this is the Fibonacci sequence. Like, essentially, a complete parallel to this scene would be if she was like, I went there and I said, take my virginity, and he laid me down, and he pumped me 3.14 times. And then the scars guard is like, are you telling me he cream pied you with pie? None of the dialogue in the film is good. The performances are average. Shy is proficient in the film. Sometimes he loses his English accent, but any time that happened, I was just like, yes, maybe he'll start improvising so he doesn't have to read this Von Trier script. But it doesn't seem like he did much improvising. His performance was good, but whose performance was great in the film was Mia Goth. I might be biased as I did declare Mia Goth the it girl of 2012-2013, on my blog, Hot Blonde Girls with Heavy Eye Makeup, but she really does give a good performance considering what she's given. It's a film that's split into two parts where it was basically all the parts that you're like, oh, well, that shouldn't have been in there. Like, I think we can take the Fibonacci sequence reference out. It's all in there. And Shia's part isn't the biggest part, but he does a good job in it. It's another notch on his belt where it's they aren't just going to be like Lewis Stevens. They can say, you know, he starred in some creepy Von Trier movie stuff, too. Worked for Kirsten Dunst. They finally stopped mentioning Kiki's Delivery Service. So why am I calling Shia LaBeouf the man of the year for 2014 when I thought his one movie this year sucked? It's because everything Shia did when he was taking time away from the screen. It's important to differentiate the things that Shia was doing for himself such as the I'm not famous anymore bag on his head on the Nymphomania red carpet, and the things that Shia was doing for a film. Recently, there have been stories coming out of the production of Fury where there's two things they're sensationalizing. One is that Shia removed one of his own teeth without any Novocaine, and the second is that to get into character, Shia stopped bathing. It's easy to relate this to mental illness, where you can be like, he's not bathing, he's losing his teeth, Shia LaBeouf, coming to a street corner near you. But if it was Colin Farrell doing the same behavior, they'll be like, Colin Farrell is so brave, I can't believe it, Colin Farrell is tearing out his teeth and not bathing, this is the greatest thing he's done since Britney Spears. I don't swing any of that stuff towards mental illness. The fact that you have the biggest movie star in the world in a high-budget, period piece means that there's not going to be any time for mental illness stuff there. You're going to be replaced in this film if you start acting up. Brad Pitt's not going to sit around and wait for you to come out of your trailer for two hours. All of this will be cleared up once they start doing press for Fury. Shia will show up, clean-shaven and jokey, and everyone will ask him about these stories, and he'll play it off in the normal way that he always does. He has great banter back and forth, a bunch of classic David Letterman moments from the Walgreens to the Orphans Alec Baldwin thing. Anytime he shows up there, Letterman doesn't really give him the crazy celebrity thing. He sort of gets it. 
He understands, because Letterman, in the same way, is doing things that Shia was doing. We can forget about all the Fury stuff. The film will come out, Shia will give a great performance, and everything will be back on track again. Beyond film is where this gets interesting. Shia LaBeouf has started the most important conversation of 2014. Is he a performance artist, or are we witnessing a celebrity meltdown? We all need to know why. Shia LaBeouf has started the most important conversation of 2014, and the fact is, we don't need to know why. The conversation now exists, and it has to be acknowledged and discussed. Shia LaBeouf is an artist, and you don't understand him because you don't understand art. I'm not trying to say I understand art either, but I understand what Shia is doing. So in this specific realm, I think I have a pretty good handle on it. Remember the artist in the box? Remember how you went there and you thought, I really don't get it, and then you just took a picture of the celebrity and left? Or remember when you went there and you were sitting at the desk and you were staring across from it at the artist, and as you were sitting there, you thought, all the way here, on the bus and the train, I put my purse next to me so that I wouldn't have to sit in this weird moment with someone, not speaking, the silence literally crackling between us, and the eye contact melting me. And now here you are, sitting, the silence between you, nothing being said, disappointment washing over you in waves, and you just stand up and think, I could have got this on the bus. And maybe that's the artist's statement. Maybe art is all around us and we aren't appreciating it. We certainly aren't appreciating what Shia LaBeouf is doing. It can be disappointing when we don't connect, and I'm going to assume that you felt like you haven't been connecting a lot recently. So after all of this, maybe you give up on art. Oh well, the city has a lot more to offer. Why not take in a performance of Cabaret? You get your tickets and before the show starts, you're looking towards the stage. There's a little commotion in the audience. Everyone who stars in the show is behind the curtain, so you can't figure out what the big deal is. Why are people so interested in whatever's happening in the audience? You stand up and try to see, but you have to look past other people who are also standing up, also trying to see. At one point, the commotion parts and you get a good look. Is that? Yeah, it is. It's Shia LaBeouf. How exciting, a celebrity sighting. You take out your phone and you take a picture, and it really just looks like a brown mush of pixels, but people can't prove it isn't Shia LaBeouf, so you upload it on six different social network accounts with the same caption on each version. You say, hanging out with Louis Stevens at Cabaret on Broadway. You get 31 likes on Facebook, 42 likes on Instagram, three tweets, two reblogs, and for some reason someone pins your photo on Pinterest despite the fact that no one can actually confirm one of those blobs is Shia LaBeouf. The show starts and you're thrilled. You feel good as your phone buzzes with notifications and you find yourself not even paying attention to the boring cabaret performance. You want something else. You want something more. You want to be able to take another picture. A better picture. Maybe even a picture that you can actually see Shia in. Your eyes redirect from the stage. You watch Shia. You pay attention to him. You start filling in what happened to him before he came here. He's chatty. He must have been day drinking. You'll have to Google it when you get home and see which pap agencies photographed him earlier in the day. You notice he has a rip in his blue t-shirt. Both sides, on the shoulders. Maybe he got in a bit of a fight with a bum beforehand. You recall reading about a bar fight Shia got into, and the time he was arrested in Walgreens. As Cabaret progresses, Shia gets louder, so much so that he becomes a distraction to other people, like he was a distraction to you. This feels like a good distraction. This feels electric. You take out your phone and try to record what's happening. All you need is 15 seconds. Come on, Shia, just yell faggot for 15 straight seconds in good lighting, and then I'll be able to sell this to TMZ. The moment has worth, not just in likes, but in monetary value. Other people are in front of you. They're capturing the same scene, better than you are. You get up from your seat to get a better angle. You become inspired. You try to turn this into the best-looking, most entertaining film you can. Shia is getting louder. He's being led out of the performance. This is amazing, and you're getting it all on camera. You are capturing this. You are making a film. Shia is led away, and you're left with boring cabaret and the experience. This experience is a picture that can be shared. It's a story that can be retold. 
It's a video that can be sold. It reminded you that you're alive. The MoMA might not have inspired anything in you, but Shia's work does. This makes you understand. This is art in 2014. No longer tethered to a physical location, people are in this world modifying reality in ways that fill us with excitement. Instead of the, I can do that complaint about art to be dismissive, people are going to find a new complaint when it comes to Shia's art. When you see what Shy is doing, you'll say, he's insane, and then you'll add the more serious observation, and he plagiarized some guy I've been told is very good because he makes real art. Ah yes, the plagiarism thing. This is a serious discussion, so I'm going to ask that you stop editing that video of copyrighted movie clips you're currently working on and pay attention to me. Yes, I'm also asking you to mute that song that you're going to put as the musical bed on there, and I'm asking you not to mix it down and upload it to YouTube, then add a commercial, because you worked really hard on it, even if it's comprised of movie clips that aren't yours and music that isn't yours. Are we paused? Okay, here's the controversy. Shia, an artist, stole from Daniel Klaus, another artist. Daniel Claus is that dude behind Ghost World, an art school confidential, and based purely on a Google image search I did, he might also be the lead singer of R.E.M. If Daniel Claus is in fact the lead singer of R.E.M., currently he's singing, That's me in the spot, light, losing credit for my intellectual property. We all agree that Shia did indeed steal from Daniel Claus. We all agree that this is bad, this is terrible. This is horrible. This is inexcusable. Unless, there is, no matter how fleeting, a possibility that all of this has been a way to get a huge amount of promo for a short film that only Jim Gaffigan had heard about until this scandal erupted. I mean, don't you remember when Shia's plagiarized film, HowardCantour.com, premiered in 2012? No matter where you went, people were like, have you seen HowardCantour.com? And other people were like, um, yes I have, why do you think I have this HowardCantour.com tattoo on my forearm? I couldn't pick up my kid from daycare without parents walking up to me and saying, HowardCantour.com is the most important unification of film and .com since Pornhub.com. Wait, no, I don't have a kid. No one has a tattoo of this short film. No one gave a shit. From 2012 to 2014, no one gave a shit about this short film. People have started giving a shit two years after this film was released. And like it or not, Shia LaBeouf has created the post-Empire advertising model. It wouldn't be hard to set this up. Instead of Daniel Klaus, we can use me as an example. Imagine I'm Daniel Klaus. Are you imagining? This is about me. I am an artist. I am an artist. This is about me. This is about me. Not Daniel. Do you understand? Me. Not Daniel. Everything is about me. I take a selfie. I delete the selfie. I take a selfie. I delete the selfie. I fix my hair. I take a selfie. The phone almost falls. I look at my cat and say, fuck, that was close. I take a picture of my cat. I post the picture of my cat. I refresh the page. I refresh the page. I refresh the page. I close the tab. I open the cat pic. I refresh the page. I delete the cat pic. I take a selfie. I delete the selfie. This is about me. I'm giving you an update about me. So where was I? Oh yeah. Let's go back to the hypothetical situation that presupposes this entire plagiarism scandal is Rise of Joaquin Phoenix Saga Part 2 Catching Fire. This probably isn't what happened, but if you're going to work on a project with a celebrity in the post-Empire world we live in, this is precisely how you should handle marketing that project. So this is about me, and I write something. After previously writing lots of things that a small number of people have read, this new something is read by the same small amount of people who read the other somethings. It just so happens that Shia LaBeouf is one of those people. Shia contacts me. And I fear that I'll be asked to replace Megan Fox or Rosie Huntington-Whitley as the sidekick in Transformers, and I instantly feel like I don't have the ass for it, but I might be able to add the type of sass that the Transformers series has been lacking ever since those racist Transformers were destroyed in Egypt. R.I.P. 
After Shia assures me that the Decepticons have been securely buried back in the core of the moon, and the only reason he's contacted me was because he wants to make a film about what I wrote, I relax. I agree that Shia can do this film, and Shia suggests that we build buzz for the film. It's going to be a long con, but it'll be worth it. Knowing that the Decepticons are at rest and probably won't be rising again until Shia and I destroy Mark Wahlberg, I agree to Shia's plan. We agree to make this small movie into something bigger. First step, we premiere the film with Shia's name on the project, but we leave my name off. This will ensure that the blogger assholes will flip out when they recognize my words but don't see them attributed. Bloggers will gleefully expose Shia, and in doing so, there's no way they can extricate Shia LaBeouf from his final product, our film. Now, this scandal's going to be buzzed about in a large number of places. A lot of people will learn about something I wrote, and a lot of people will learn about me. A lot of people will read this story. But the problem is, a lot of people will forget about this story because it won't be news in two days. With a 24-hour news cycle, Shia LaBeouf's plagiarism would be the worst thing, the worst possible thing all these bloggers have seen until someone else does something that is the worst possible thing all these bloggers have seen about 18 hours later. The current blogging atmosphere is like a paper shredder. Imagine every story as a single piece of paper. Once the piece of paper is reviewed, it's fed through the shredder. You can provide a new piece of paper, and that piece of paper provides new information which requires new review, and then that's put through the shredder. If we take that story of the filthy plagiarism carried out by Shia LaBeouf, and we feed it through the shredder, the shredder will stop running as soon as it gets to the far edge of the paper. If we were to assemble a stack of somewhat slightly varying but essentially the same pieces of paper, and one by one they had to be reviewed and fed into the shredder, the shredding would not stop until someone unplugged the shredder. And it's hard to unplug this shredder. Unplugging this shredder is like, you ever been in an apartment where they have the fridge built into the wall, and then suddenly something goes wrong with the fridge, and you're like, I don't know how to unplug this thing, we're gonna have to cut a hole in the back to get to it. You would have to cut a hole in the back of the shredder to stop it. Or we could stop feeding it paper. What Shy has been doing is he's been making his art on these pieces of paper, and he's been feeding them into the shredder, and he doesn't care what happens. He doesn't care if it's destroyed by the people who are feeding it into the shredder. He just wants it out there. Shia has posted some odd things. Most recently, I watched a video of him jumping rope for an hour. The video, posted to Vimeo, because it has more artistic integrity, I suppose. It doesn't have the YouTube ads. You aren't going to have to watch a Charmin commercial before you watch Shia Jump Rope. Is an example of something that he's putting out there. I'm not saying that filming yourself jumping rope is art. Working out and filming it is not art. Everyone is projecting the fact that they work out, and this is something that Shia is pulling on. The way it's framed is that Shia is in a very nice backdrop, and he walks out, He's in a full lime green outfit, and he has a jump rope. This very nice background appears to be his backyard. We're watching Shia LaBeouf for an hour in his backyard. Probably before he got to his backyard, he went to go pick up Mia Goth from yoga and went to get a coffee. So we have pictures of him getting Mia at yoga. We have pictures of him getting a coffee, but then he gets into his house. And we don't know what goes on once Shy is in his backyard. And this is making people mad. Most recently, over the 4th of July weekend, someone purchased a drone and flew it over Miley Cyrus's house into her backyard. And there was literally paparazzi footage of Miley's party in the USA. This is what it's become. And this is why Shia's video is also art. Shia is saying, you're waiting out there in the truck. All right, here's your footage. You don't even have to shoot it, I'm going to upload it for you. And if you watch this footage, miraculously, Shia does jump rope for an entire hour. The frames do slow down a bit, so that it could be looping at some point, but I haven't been able to detect the looping point yet. There's no clear hard edits, so not only is Shia making important conversations, but he's also an inspiration to any of us who want to be able to jump rope for an hour. Back to the plagiarism thing. Let's hop back to it. So let's say the plagiarism is unintentional. 
If Daniel Klaus had no idea what was going to happen and he was just happily recording R.E.M.'s last album and drawing comics, then my post-Empire marketing theory is totally unrelated to this situation. Even in the case where Daniel wasn't involved in this, we have to acknowledge that there's a system in place that this could have been taken care of without the cease and desist letters, without the instant vilification of Shia LaBeouf. Here's a timeline of how it would happen if the superhero blogosphere was removed from the equation. 1. Shia plagiarizes. 2. A publisher, an agent, a creator, or a fan notices the plagiarism. 3. An email is sent and a deal is struck. 4. Daniel doesn't have to write a 5,000 word article on this issue because he's more talented than I am and has better shit to do. The system continues to work. Everyone says that, well, Shia's revolting against the system. Copyright made Shia rich and he can't mock it through art. But you're wrong. I mean, yeah, that is true, but I've never paid to see a Transformers movie, but I've seen all of the Transformers with Shia LaBeouf. So I guess... In a way, I'm violating copyright as well. I downloaded those movies off Put Locker or Mega Upload or whatever was out at that point. Hell, the old Transformers is probably so old I downloaded it off LimeWire, so I probably got a virus while I was watching that Transformers too. Alright, maybe we'll knock that one off because it's a PC support cost balanced out in the end. After some superhero blogger noticed Shia's plagiarism, Shia did an interview with the very brave blogger and allowed the blogger to post it on his website. The blogger, of course, desperately demanded that his site be named as the source for the interview. Everyone has to link back to him because he's the creator of this interview. God forbid someone would take the words from this interview and post them as their own. He would have to write another article about that man and Shia LaBeouf. They would be in cahoots. They would be the Bonnie and Clyde and or Bonnie and Bonnie, Clyde and Clyde plagiarism team. In the interview, Shia stole quotes from, I don't know, probably Gandhi. That's a safe bet. And a few other people. I'm sure that another guy with another blog read the interview, emailed the guy with the interview and said, if I give you full credit, can I find out what the references are and then post excerpts on my blog? And then now we have two blog guys who say, go over here for the references, but go here for the main title. And both of these guys have to get the traffic for the interview that Shy agreed to do. Remember, everyone, don't steal from either of those blogs. You have to give full credit. We're all very important pieces in this machine, and we can't be merely referred to as cogs. We can't just be gears. We need a special name. The guy got the interview with Shia by looking up Shia's email address, then sending him an email. With Shia, everyone was so intrigued not only because of what he was doing, but also because of how he was doing it. And this is no different. Nowadays, there's this celebrity PR cleanup machine that goes everywhere. I think this machine was put together during the Kristen Stewart and Robert Pattinson Twilight era, where there was clearly a lot going on there that needed to be contained. And so they would get this cunty lady who would go into these interviews and immediately cut it off. They'd be like, Carson Daly, your rebellious interview style is too much for me. Like, that's what it was. They were making Carson Daly out to be Howard Stern. But that was their job. They would look bad so their client could look good. And this person goes everywhere. Radio interviews. They're appointed by the studio, pretty much. And they'll make their clients say everything. They'll plan it out. They'll write it out. Most recently, you probably saw it when Jonah Hill went on this tour. Where Jonah Hill, a guy who's famous for saying fucked up things, was like, I'm really, really sorry. You know how many gay friends I have. That's why I've come here on roller skates, in hot pants, and I'm shooting Liza Minnelli t-shirts out of this t-shirt gun to show you that, yes, I said something bad to a paparazzi, but I still love Lady Gaga. People expected that when the Shia thing came out, but there was no PR person. There was no press release, or if it was, no one gave a shit about it, because they were getting the information straight from Shia. In the absence of a PR person, there's also a new avenue that is opened for apology, and that is the Twitter account. I follow 140 people on Twitter, and 
every single person I follow has issued at least one apology where they're like, I'd just like to say to my 37 followers, I wasn't thinking about the Jonah Hill hot pants joke that it would be offensive to gay people so much so that they almost were like, you forgot to put RT Jonah Hill before this comment. I apologized for that. And I ask for forgiveness. And they have to do it in like three tweets because it only gives you like 140 characters to apologize in. So that's what people were expecting. They were like, oh, we didn't get the PR apology. We'll get the Twitter apology. And then when you went to at campaign book Shia's Twitter account, you weren't met with a series of apology tweets. You were met with a picture of a cease and desist letter. Immediately, instead of saying, my actions are not my actions, you know I don't act like this normally, and I will act better in the future because I'm an actor. Shia said, here are the repercussions of my actions. Here is a cease and desist letter in the banner of my Twitter account. And it's from the lawyer. You can read this cease and desist letter. I will show you exactly what happens in this industry when someone gets a scent that they aren't getting some sense. When Shia did this, Everyone had to go to the crazy default. But there's a difference between being crazy and not giving a fuck. As a writer, I understand why Daniel had his attorney send out a cease and desist letter. As a person with arms and legs and fingers and a head and a body that works as a human being, I read that cease and desist letter and literally my entire focus in life became to create unauthorized versions of Daniel Klaus's work in film. All that lawyer did was make me think, I don't even want to write fiction anymore. I only want to transcribe Daniel Klaus's words into screenplays and then film them. It was that much of a hateable thing where they took this creative thing and they made it a crime. And it was the immediate escalation, the 1 to 10 escalation that always has to happen now. You're telling me Daniel couldn't contact Shia? A guy like Jimbo's movie blog was able to contact Shia within 40 seconds of this happening, but Daniel was like, nope, I don't know, I don't know, I, I wish there was a way, I wish there was a way to contact Shia LaBeouf, but it's impossible. If only we had a way to communicate via individually unique, identifiable addresses in a worldwide web of sorts that would create a vast virtual post office where I could send a communication to Shia and we could communicate back and forth via these electronic messages. I will have to consult someone on this. Maybe we can get the ball rolling on this service. Maybe Steve Jobs can do this. We could call it iEmail. Or maybe if we want it to be even shorter, we could call it iMessage. So Steve Jobs, I'm imploring you, so that I don't have to send cease and desist letters out anymore, please create iMessage. And that's why the letter puts you on Shia's side. Because if you aren't on Shia's side, if you are on Daniel's side, you're also on the side of that lawyer. And being on the side of a lawyer is like being a Terry Richardson apologist. And there's that word, apology. Shia knew the apology was necessary. He knew he had to apologize to Daniel. And the way the PR people have you apologize is you go on and you're like, Kathy Lee Gifford, I apologize to Daniel for not properly crediting him. I was an overzealous fan. I really forgot protocol on this one, and I'll never do it again. I've made a donation to Remember Kids, the REM Kids Foundation, and I hope it's the right step in making up with Daniel. You have to give that apology. Apologies are required by a subsection of the internet that has their head in the clouds, so they just view everything as blue skies until a rich man comes along and parks his fluffy cloud in that blue sky, and he has to be destroyed for it. He has to be shot out of the air. That has to happen. And since there are these blue sky people who are angry at the clouds, Shia did some skywriting. He apologized. I'm sorry, Daniel Klaus. In the sky. It was an apology, but... It was also a fuck you. It was a fuckology. Which, Lars von Trier, for the record, if you steal that, I will know. I'll be like, this is so bad, either I created this on a podcast, or it's just a Lars von Trier script. The skywriting was a fuckology, because it's basically Shia saying, 
I'm sorry, bro. I took the money I was going to spend on this high-priced lawyer, and I wrote something in the sky for you. Are sky words admissible in court? Do you have an objection, your honor? Does the S not look like enough of an S? I admit that too. It looks a little boxy. But we're writing words in the sky. You have to give me some leeway. When people reacted negatively to this sky writing, there was a second sky writing. Stop creating. Then there was a third sky writing. To start creating. I create things. I feel like part of the start creating movement. I try to create with a James Franconian pace. To make you aware of all the things I'm creating, this is what I've accrued. I have a Twitter, two Facebooks, a MySpace, still, a Blogspot, a Goodreads, three Tumblrs, a personal website, an Instagram, and an Amazon authors page. All I do, all day long, when I'm not working on my fiction, is I beg you to retweet my tweets and like my comments and do whatever you do on MySpace and share blog spots and reblog my Tumblr and reference my personal website and heart my Instagram pictures and write on my Amazon author message board that you really like my books but you could do without the seemingly constant jokes about fucking. This isn't a Von Trier book. Because the thing is, I need your attention. I require you to acknowledge my writing. But if you download a book from a torrent, you have violated my rights and I will send a cease and desist letter so fast, I will ban you from the internet. Once Steve Jobs creates his iMessage, I will make sure you will never use it. You will have no idea what it looks like. You won't even see an emoji on that. If you illegally download the book that I have put up for sale on Amazon, if you infringe on my rights like that, I will destroy you. Copying another writer's work or getting it off the internet is totally unacceptable without full payment, and I'm so glad these bloggers and Pat and Oswald have pointed it out. Thank God, because the fact remains, my creative genius can never be copied. Copying is the ultimate sin in writing. For example, my newest novel is about the victimization of women in the fashion industry. And it's quite similar to a book that's already out called Imperial Bedrooms by Brett Easton Ellis. Imperial Bedrooms is 200 pages shorter than my book, but the 200 pages that it does run for are better than all of the pages in my book. But Imperial Bedrooms isn't about the fashion industry. It's about the film industry. My novel is totally different than Brett's novel. In my novel, beautiful women, lying about their age, are taken advantage of by older men in power positions. In Imperial Bedrooms, beautiful women, lying about their age, are taken advantage of by men in power positions. The books are completely unique and also kind of the same book. I know that my book is different from Brett's because over 20% of my book is just transcribed text messages and emails and Facebook chats. But I guess in order for you to figure out how different they are, you have to purchase both of these books legally, not illegally downloading them, and then you have to compare them on your blog. So you can be like, on page 89 of Imperial Bedrooms, the main character expresses a thirst, and a vague hangover. Also present in Empire Waste in page 139, the author drank earlier in the day. It could be assumed that there is a hangover going on there, and he gets a glass of water. Clearly an apology is in order. I hope that Knopf will immediately issue something on this, and I hope that Tom Reagan is destroyed and murdered. So why did I write a book that's already been written? Here's the point where I steal from someone else. This is an idea someone else had. It came from someone else's book. This is not my idea. So open up your blog, water your Shia pet, you can cut his hair into a fury haircut, and then you can write furiously about how I stole from Chuck Palahniuk. In Chuck Palahniuk's sci-fi oral history rant, available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, there's a Goodreads page for it, but there definitely isn't a torrent file for it unless you want to get kicked off of books forever. We'll send you to a jail without books. Even Hannibal Lecter got books, but you're worse than that. You're worse than Hannibal Lecter. You won't have to wear a mask. We'll mask your fingers so you can't plagiarize anyone while you're there. You'll be like a Lobster Boy. No, you can't plagiarize Lobster Boy because Lobster Boy's lawyer is sending a cease and desist to you as I read this. In Chuck Palnick's rant is the idea of peak boosting, but I can't read it word for word. I own the book. It's on my shelf, but I don't want to have to skywrite to Chuck Palnick. 
so I'm going to paraphrase. Peak boosting, as I recall it, is the act of taking someone else's memory and digesting it in your nervous system. What's a memory you like? Since you can't respond back to me, and I'm the only one who talks on this podcast, I'll tell you about a memory I like. There's this memory I have of a video. I saw this video, it was around the time Transformers 2 was coming out. Shia was doing press with Megan Fox. They were in France, and things were so French there. It was an all-white room, there was an LCD screen, and on the LCD screen, in front of Shia and Megan, were questions from the fans. Because the fans are important. The journalists aren't important. The fans are important. And do you know why the fans are important? Because of your money and no other reason. You are useless in the creative process except for your cash money. Because otherwise we would have to get real jobs like the fans. Sounds terrible. And in this video, Shia, Megan, sitting there, screen. On the screen, it says, Shia, Megan. How do you do the perfect Hollywood kiss? And then there's a button between Shia and Megan, and they could have hit it if they didn't want to answer a question, and it would go, ow! And so I was like, oh, they're going to ow the shit out of this one. But they didn't ow it. They turned to each other, and then they shared this electric kiss. And so that's the moment that I want. I want that moment. And so imagine I download that experience and then upload it into my nervous system. And so I feel exactly what that kiss was like. And it feels amazing. It feels incredible for the first 10 times. Then it gets a little old. And so I need to boost the peak. I need to bring it back up to another feeling that is as powerful as the first time I felt it. And the way we can boost that peak is to mix it with someone else's memory. So we have the Shia and Megan kissing, and then let's take the memory of Brian Austin Green watching Shia and Megan kiss. That's a complicated thing there, because I'm pretty sure they were broken up at this point. If my Megan Fox chronology report is right, which I'm referencing right now, I have printed that out. I have copyrighted it. If I see you with a Megan Fox chronology report, I will send a cease and desist letter. And as I'm reviewing it, it does appear that she was broken up with Brian Austin Green when this kiss occurred. Imagine we take the boost of Brian Austin Green with sort of the regret, the hurt, the need, and then we combine it with the electric kiss. And we're going to boost that peak. And now we have a totally unique experience. This isn't the kiss, it's the kiss and more. I'm taking a single, highly pleasurable experience, and I'm changing how it makes me feel. It creates a more complicated and advanced new individual product. And I know you could say peak boosting is almost like addiction. Where with addiction, there's the Lizzie Wurzel memoir, Now More Again. That's how addiction works. I need now, I need more, and I need it again. I'm going to steal from someone else now. I don't remember who it is, but someone on the Mark Marin podcast, I think, was quoting someone else about addiction, and I don't remember the specific joke, but I remember the punchline is. So, with any addiction, you eventually end up being the guy with a hairbrush shoved up his ass. Let me say that's not my joke, and Lars von Trier, don't use that in your next movie. Don't do it. I know, I can see you, Lars, I can see you like, oh, this is good, this is good, the hairbrush in the butt. No, it was a joke. And addiction does come into play. I have an addictive personality. We've seen Shia with that big blue book where we know what that indicates. But it's also different. Addiction and creation can work together. They can go hand in hand. But you don't get creation from addiction. It's not a side effect. Where it's like, oh man, I did all this coke and now I'm a world-renowned chess player. Oh man, I did all this coke and now I have a mini series on TNT. Like that's the reality for some people, but they have a mini series on TNT because they have a talent and they have coke because they have money. But a lot of art now is escalation. Even look at the Transformers movie. The Transformers movies are all the same idea. People have already seen the guy turn into a car three times, so when the guy turns into a car the fourth time and none of the original stars are there, you have to escalate it. And you're going to take pieces that worked before and you're going to say, all right, they liked it when the guy in the car uh, beeped his horn at the little kid. We'll put that back in there again. 
And so you're plagiarizing yourself as you're creating this next thing. The last time it felt good, so now it's going to feel even better once we get more. That's how a lot of pleasure works. If 5 feels good, then 10 is what you'll need next time. Like if I get 3 reblogs on my feminist rant about Disney's Frozen, I bet I could go see Disney's Frozen again with a notebook, find more feminist stuff to say, and then I can write another piece that gets 10 notes on Tumblr. I'll delete the original 3 note piece, I'll add the 10 note piece, I'll add my source name in there, I'll make sure that no one else can copyright it, I'll disable the ability to right click on my page so that no one can take this from me, and if they do, they have to reference my Tumblr URL, Lolita Farter 896 if I find even a piece of it somewhere else and my Lolita Farter 896 isn't on there, I will destroy everyone. I will get all of my followers to go and get this plagiarist because I was the one who sat through Disney's Frozen twice. That's $22 of Disney's Frozen I had to sit there to get my feminist rant. And I want my $22 worth of love, respect, and admiration. Ah yes, Tumblr. Creatives on Tumblr were outraged by Shia LaBeouf. They couldn't believe the disrespect that he had created. Then, two posts later, they post a copyrighted image that they didn't pay a license fee for. It was truly backwards that Shia received the scorn of a site filled with users who take photographs and writing that's copyrighted, then allows the user to put it under Lolita Fart Girl 892. For example, no, I don't know Mia Goth. Shia knows Mia, I don't know Mia. I saw her in one film, I saw her in some ads. I saw her in a Vogue Italia, I ordered the Vogue Italia. The Vogue Italia shows up, I take a straight razor and I razor out the page with Mia Goth on it carefully. I take out that page, I scan it into my computer, and then I add a little watermark that says tjamesreagan.com on there. Then I post it to my Tumblr and I tag like Mia Goth, It Girl, Nymphomaniac, Vogue Italia, I hit all the bases on that so everyone can see Tom got this picture, Tom ordered the magazine, Tom posted it up on his Tumblr, Tom has a watermark there, I better email him to see if it's okay if I can post it on my Tumblr. And if you take that picture and save it and crop out my watermark, I will report you. Expect a cease and desist letter. Sorry Lana Del Rey fan 8942 Summer Crown, you're done, you're gone. I will get you taken off Tumblr for taking what's mine that I took from someone else. Shia isn't doing some sort of real life version of tumbling art, he's creating it. There's influences, but what art doesn't have influence? If we removed all influence from art and we'd be like, that's derivative of that, that's derivative of that, we would only have the Bible which is the ultimate book, but I like the variation that people can do by providing their own takes on things. I think it's peak boosting. If we go back to that, let's say Marina somehow has a creative copyright for every time a person sits down in a chair and looks at some other weird Eastern European looking person. Let's say that she has the copyright on that. That anytime you sit in a chair across from someone, like let's say it's really busy at the coffee shop and you're two people and you just sit down there with your laptop, the barista will come over and she will hand you a cease and desist letter and say, you are now plagiarizing, the artist is present, and then you'll have to turn your chair the other way, the opposite way of the table, and bend your arms back and try to lift your coffee like that because it's that complicated and you don't want to infringe on her rights. Shia peak boosted the artist is present for his I'm Sorry show. The show, quite brilliantly, was located directly across the street from the office of the ninth circle of the internet, BuzzFeed. Shia invited you in. He would stay for a period of time. It was up to the artist and up to the audience how long this went for. As you walked into the first room, on the table, artfully set out, would be a bunch of different items. And these different items, you look at them, they would have no importance. And the items were a whip, a crystal skull, a bottle of Jack Daniels. You show up to your friend's house, you see that stuff, and you're like, dude, what the fuck do you spend your money on? You need to get off eBay. You haven't paid child support in eight months, and you just bought a crystal skull. But Cheyenne knew that if he took that Jack Daniels bottle and you said, oh, Cheyenne's got a drinking problem, there's a Jack Daniels bottle there. 
And he knew, oh, Shy was Indiana Jones, there's a whip there. And then you knew, oh, that's a crystal skull, which is either filled with vodka, or it's from that Indiana Jones movie, Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, one or the other. Either way, I'm picking up the crystal skull. You pick up the crystal skull, you go into the next room. In the next room, Shia's sitting there in a tux. What are you wearing? You're wearing a t-shirt. Why didn't you dress up for this? Shia dressed up for it. He's also wearing a bag on his head that says, I'm not famous anymore. You sit down at the table, you place down the crystal skull, and you're able to say whatever you want to Shia. Not only has he removed the PR person from this, he's removed all barriers of celebrity. Celebrity puts you on a pedestal, and in a way, he wasn't famous anymore because he was sitting across from you. So you're sitting there, and you have the crystal skull, and you can say whatever you want. There was one lady they interviewed, and in line, I don't know who interviewed her, so send your cease and desist letter to me, uh, whichever blog interviewed this lady. But she said that she was going to confront Shia about how he treats food service workers. And she got to do that. Normally, if someone stiffs you on a tip, you go on Reddit and say, Hey Reddit, guess who I served today? And you have like a grainy picture of them and they'll be like, And check out what the tip was. And you take a picture and then Yahoo will pick it up and they'll be like, Shia LaBeouf only tipped 84 cents at a Waffle House. And the best you can do is have that Reddit post or you could tweet him and be like, fuck you. Shia was giving you direct access, so you could say whatever you wanted, and with that direct access, you didn't have to go to all those other outlets. You were able to directly speak with him, where once Steve Jobs creates this magical iMessage thing, Daniel Klaus won't have to sue people anymore because he can use this magical iMessage thing to contact them in the same way that Shia created I'm Sorry. He was showing us that it's about context. Where that whip just sitting on the table, if you saw it normally, you'd be like, what, what the fuck's a whip doing here? But once it was on a table and you knew the guy was in Indiana Jones there, you'd say, was this a prop from the movie? This is a prop from the movie. What if Harrison Ford touched this? Harrison Ford touched that whip, and I'm going to touch that whip now. What if I picked up that whip and I just cracked it? I would be Indiana Jones. And your fucking face melts off once you get this context, where it's different if you see something posted up in a museum compared to if you see it posted up on a fridge. The post-Empire idea of art being everywhere is being provided by people like Shia LaBeouf or people like Banksy or Shepard Faraday. All these people are bringing out art. They're peak boosting this art. And we always were peak boosting comics. Let's make that clear. Let's just take a look at that. Shia LaBeouf took a comic and peak boosted it into a film. A guy from one of the biggest franchises in the entire world in the history of film took a comic book and made it into a film. Do you know what all of the other biggest franchises are? They're comic books that were turned into films. What Shia was doing there was on such a small level, but it was a commentary on what we're doing right now. We're creating by, oh, let's just pull all this shit out from a comic book. Let's throw it on the screen. Like, name some of your favorite Spider-Man writers. Are you naming Sam Raimi or that fucking loser guy who wrote the Joseph gordon Levet movie and then somehow got the Spider-Man franchise? Because they're like, hey, this guy made a good Zoe Deschanel movie. He knows cute. You know who's cute? Spidey. Spidey with his cute little cuteness. Or it's like, no. Spidey was fucking a dorky skinny guy. As a dorky skinny guy, that's why we like Spidey. I mean, think about it he would have to create these movies. I mean, how many times have you been able to finger your date after you both mutually just read Iron Man 55? Probably very few times. But you can go to Iron Man, and as long as it's not the second one, which sort of had to set up the Marvel Universe so it got out of what it was supposed to be, you can go to Iron Man, and you can get a hand job. I had sex after I saw the first Iron Man. It was awesome. Not the third Iron Man, though. But think about it. Remember when I was informing you who Daniel Klaus was? I was like, you know this guy from Ghost World. You know this guy from Art School Confidential. And then remember when I was like, I think he's also an REM. He might be Michael Stipe. I don't know who this guy is. I don't know. I'm collapsing right now. I'm just going to make a joke and then get out of it as quick as possible. I mean, hmm. I wonder how I knew Ghost World in Art School Confidential. But then I couldn't name anything else. I mean, I love watching Ghost World. 
I love watching Art School Confidential. If only someone else made a film out of a Daniel Klaus comic. Could you imagine that? I mean, it would be tough because Hollywood doesn't really care about intellectual comics. Really, what it would take for another Daniel Klaus movie to be made is that there would have to be some guy who had a lot of pull in Hollywood. He would have to be able to greenlight this picture just based on his name alone. And he'd probably have to do a lot of the work himself. He wouldn't be able to get an all-star cast, but he would be able to call in favors, where hopefully some celebrity like that comes along, appreciates Daniel's work, and then we can bring it back onto the screen again. This is how people discover things. This is how it happens. Right now, if you make a movie, if you make a TV show, if you make a podcast, all of these things are going to get people into your other stuff. They're going to get you into the stuff you actually want them to read. Like, for example, remember the, all those conversations you had about The Walking Dead before it premiered on AMC? Remember how people were just like, well, I was reading this zombie graphic novel last weekend, and other people were like, continue talking about this. We want to hear more about your zombie graphic novel. Those conversations never happen, and now they do happen. It's different, and that's just how content is passed now. No one gives a shit about novels or comic books, but once you make them give a shit, they actually will read them. But the problem is, while we're having this conversation on how we can get people to read comic books, how we can get people to read novels, everyone is panicking because they just see the dollars. The conversation about what is art and what we own as creatives is essential to this new digital climate. Right now, as a guy who puts out content into the world, I just want you to appreciate my content. I'm putting it out in the world because I've written 15 novels and they're sitting on my hard drive doing nothing but i have these two novels that are out and i don't care how you get these two novels if you steal them if you download them if you email me at tjamesreagan.com and say hey tom i would like an electronic copy of both of your novels for free and i want that picture of your cat that you took earlier in your podcast then i'll send you that shit i will send it to you tjamesreagan at outlook.com because it's not about the fact that I'm like cease and desist this sounds like something I've done before because I'm peak boosting other stuff I'm influenced by other stuff so just take my stuff and you can be influenced as well Shia LaBeouf is doing this now he's posting things and he's making you realize what's going on here that's what we're looking at right now is that art and content all have a worth and so the labels of plagiarist or narcissist or crazy person, they're very simple ways that old people in a system that they're counting on to continue to make them money are disregarding everything new in the new rules of content. Where Shia LaBeouf has these post-empire ideas and he's bringing the art to you and he's not charging you for it. And the problem that everyone's having is that he's not charging you for it. You haven't paid to see anything that the campaign book has done in 2014. Yes, copyright made Shia rich, but he's not asserting copyright on any of the stuff that he's doing right now. He's peak boosting things, and he's allowing other people to build off it. You know what's not going to happen after I post this podcast? A cease and desist letter from Shia LaBeouf. I'll check my mail every day. I will keep you guys updated. In the next version of the Vice Rejection Saga, I will tell you how many cease and desists I've gotten, and I imagine probably the only one is going to come from Daniel Klaus. So there are some observations to be made here. In this post-Empire world of content, you have to realize that your words are overpriced. Your art is not monogamous to you, and your inability to review new ways to distribute what you're doing is making what you're doing irrelevant. So in closing, as a writer who has copyrights, I am disgusted by Shia LaBeouf. I don't think we should be engaging in the conversation he's demanding. And now, if you'll excuse me, I need to go back to promoting my book that has the exact same plot as a book that Brett Easton Ellis released eight years ago. Thank you.